This podcast is brought to you by the School of Advanced Study, University of London. Well, um, it gives me great pleasure to for the final Sport and Leisure seminar of the semester to introduce Dr. Marcus Collins, who's um, a senior lecturer at the University of Loughborough. And Marcus is today going to be giving a paper entitled The Beatles and British Intellectuals, based on his ongoing research into the Beatles in the 1960s. Thanks, Liam. Okay, so thanks a lot for inviting me. Um, it's difficult for a civilised literary man to understand pop. So said the journalist Ray Goslin in 1970, and so it proved. But the advent of the Beatles at least made them try. The gallery of people you've seen before you gives you a sense of how um, the men and occasional women of letters who commented about the Beatles represent a virtual pantheon of the British intelligentsia in the 1960s. The purpose of this paper is to make sense of what they said, to understand the impact of the Beatles on British culture, and thereby to reconstruct the worldview of British intellectual life. Now, there hasn't been an, an enormous amount of scholarly work on this subject, but from what there exists can be discerned three basic models or narratives. The first is one of immediate acceptance. I've already talked about William Mann and his um, very famous um, declaration in, in The Times that Lennon and McCartney were the outstanding English composers of 1963. And, um, some people see this as, an, as a very rapid um, embrace of the Beatles by um, the British establishment. Um, occasionally, John Lennon endorsed this view where he talked about how, as he described him, the bullshitter, William Mann, wrote the first intellectual review of the Beatles, which got people talking about us in an intellectual way. All the middle classes intellectuals are going, ooh, aren't they clever? Um, this idea also appears in early rock criticism, in um, works um, by people like Nick Cohn, who actually credits Lennon's writings as being uh, important too, and has a certain amount of scholarly support. Um, Arthur Marwick, and his, um, in 1971, as early as 1971, talks about this. And of course, it develops in, as, as part of his model of the Cultural Revolution in the 1960s. The second model is one of a later legitimation. Um, the turning point is seen as happening not during Beatlemania in 1963, 1964, but mid-career, particularly with the re release of Sgt Pepper, which was famously described by Kenneth Tynan, who we met earlier, as a decisive moment in the history of Western civilization. This model finds favour with Paul McCartney, who fondly recalls in his authorised biography um, immersing himself in London's vibrant cultural scene of the mid-1960s. And also can be found in scholarly work um, by people like Bernard Gendron um, and Kenneth Womack, so the Beatles evolve into artists and they are recognised as such. A third model is that of rejection. And this was sometimes voiced by the mercurial Lennon himself when the mood suited him. So he told um, the Canadian um, the academic, Marshall McLuhan, in 1969, they don't take it seriously in England, that's all. They treat us like they're children, you know. You're an entertainer boy. Now get back on the boards. Um, the only real scholarly representative of this school is David Fowler, who has claimed that, um, first of all, the Beatles were driven by sort of base commercial motives. Secondly, that their appeal was confined to working class teeny boppers, in contrast to the older and hipper um, clientele of the Rolling Stones, and that this combination of these two things led to an excoriation of the Beatles, um, first by um, Paul Johnson and David Holbrook in 1964, and later by the radical left student activists like John Hoyland in 1968. 
Now, what I'm going to be arguing here um, is along different lines. Um, I will first of all be very much expanding the um, subject of inquiry. Most of the work done to date has relied on a small number of reference points who we've already talked about, William Mann, Kenneth Tynan's famous quotation about Sergeant Pepper, um, uh, Paul Johnson, a few others. I'll also be dealing with the period as a whole, from the arrival of the Beatles um, to national prominence in 1963, um, to um, the sort of afters in the early 1970s. And this gets away from the problem that some scholars face of just looking at Beatlemania or just looking at um, psychedelia and by their nature um, finding um, that as being the most important period. I'm going to argue that there was no clear direction of travel and that there was no simple single line of demarcation. Rather, what you saw happening in Britain was a fully fledged and often intemperate debate. It, this paper will show 60s culture to be divided, conflicted and volatile, but on the whole inhospitable to the Beatles. Um, I don't have a particularly sophisticated definition of intellectual. I'm talking about someone who is considered or considers themselves to be intelligent. Um, academics are intellectuals by definition, but there was little scholarly attention um, to the Beatles before they broke up in Britain. Authors, artists, broadcasters, musicians who habitually sought to communicate about serious subjects in an intelligent manner to an educated audience would also be included, as would journalists for apparently serious publications like broadsheets, critical and literary weeklies, um, and I'll include the more cerebral of rock critics. For the purposes of this talk, I'm going to be excluding those within the Beatles' inner circle. So um, Yoko Ono would um, appear as a, as a subject rather than an actor, and the same can go for people like Barry Miles. I'm excluding scientists, because I've written about them elsewhere, and I'm not discussing drugs, religion, class, and politics, because again, I've written about that. Um, so, I'm going to start off by talking about um, how intellectuals encountered the Beatles. How did they come across them in the 1960s? Well, first of all, there were face-to-face -face encounters. Only a few of them um, reported seeing them actually perform live. Um, Noel Coward was one infamous example. More, more intellectuals interviewed them, but the in-depth interviews by heavyweight writers only got going in earnest in the second half of the 1960s. Um, so Hunter Davis, who's another person in the inner circle who I won't be talking about really, um, arranged to meet Paul McCartney in the autumn of 1966 because, as he put it, I've never read any interview in which they've been asked seriously about how they composed. Um, there were some tetchy encounters um, between the Beatles and intellectuals on things like chat shows, so you had these incongruous um, meetings of John Lennon and Yehudi Menuhin or Wolf Mankiewicz. Um, and a few met them in other professional ca capacities. So Arnold Good Goodman as a lawyer, um, George Orton as a screenwriter. <coughs> they also met them at social events. More commonly, intellectuals got to know the Beatles through the media. Their music was unavoidable. The journalist Derwent May um, talked in December 1963 of how the relentless sound of the Liverpool beat was filling the English air today, the ramshot yeah, yeah of the Beatles. Yet not many of the over 30s, who I'm talking about here, mentioned buying Beatles records. To many, this would have seemed um, tantamount to fandom, which was largely what they weren't about. And this helps to explain why knowledge of their musical output was actually limited. So commentary was littered with mistakes that would have been immediately apparent 
to um, most fans. I'm just wondering if I can, given that I'm on the computer, I can show you that. Um, so, um, that's no good. Okay, I'm just going to tell you about them. So they misspell names. There are whole books where McCartney is spelt M-A-C. Um, they misattribute compositions. Um, so um, Howard Barker wrote a whole play um, which was under the impression that John Lennon wrote Andrew Rigby. Um, they misnamed songs. That William Mann um, article um, talks about a song called That Boy. Um, and the and Geoffrey Cannon, the rock critic, um, manages to mangle other titles. They misquote lyrics and they misidentify instrumentalists so that the Wilfred Mellers, rather bizarrely, um, has Ringo playing the sitar. Um, <laughs> but the Beatles were not just yowling away on steam radio, as the spectator put it. They were making the most unexpected media appearances um, as, pop, uh, as pop singers. They appeared in news broadcasts, in the financial pages of broadsheets when they floated on the stock exchange, in Sunday Times Insight investigations and in any number of TV specials. They also created controversies which received news coverage and made direct incursions into intellectuals' territory through their side projects. So they wrote books, John Lennon, two volumes, 1964-1965. They made films, Magical Mystery Tour, 1967. <coughs> they exhibited artwork, um, John Lennon, um, in 68 and 70, and there was also a retrospective of Stuart Sutcliffe in 1967. They put on plays um, at the National Theatre um, and the Roundhouse, um, adapting their work or they contributed to them. And they were also the subject of or inspiration for other artists' work. So they appeared as cameos in novels, in David Lodge's first novel, The British Museum is Falling Down. They inspired plays, they were quoted in films, they provided music for at least three ballets and dance performances, their faces appeared in paintings, sculptures and photographs exhibited at the Royal Academy, at um, the ICA. And then the final way in which intellectuals encountered the Beatles was through each other's writing. And it's important to recognise that intellectuals were often responding to other intellectuals' comments about the Beatles, rather than directly to the Beatles' lives and art. Um, there, were, there were no full-length academic books about the Beatles written in Britain until 1973, and there were only a small number of academic articles. But there were book chapters, um, there were works about popular music, um, generally written by journalists. There were broadcasts, there were reviews, editorials, essays. All of these ways um, were ways that intellectuals um, came across the Beatles in the 60s, which explains why um, so much was written about them and said about them. So, um, what's an intellectual to do with the Beatles? Okay. Intellectuals saw their role as providing um, discernment and knowledge um, that was otherwise missing from public discussion. Um, some people felt it was just completely beneath their dignity to talk about the Beatles, that this was a fundamentally unintellectual topic. So the Oxford Don, John Gross, wrote in 1963 that there's surely almost nothing that an intelligent man really wants to say about them one way or another. And Eric Hobsbawm, um, despite writing an article about the Beatles, um, decided um, that the Beatles were beneath critical notice. This was because they um, did not qualify in the ways that um, intellectuals recognised as being um, cultural figures. So they regarded popular culture and popular music more specifically as being fundamentally ephemeral, 
and the Beatles as likely to disappear quite soon. And they saw them as being unoriginal. And, they, and as a symptom rather than the cause of the fanaticism and media frenzy surrounding them. So as the journalist Alan Bryan put it, uh, we don't study a shoe to understand a shoe fetishist. But even the most phobic intellectuals were willing to discuss Beatlemania um, rather than talk about the Beatles themselves because they thought that Beatlemania um, was of sociological significance. So Anthony Burgess um, reasoned that it was precisely because Beatles' <coughs> drivel, as he put it, was low and corrupting, that it deserved attention from writers such as himself. Uh, it was corrupting. It was therefore affecting society. Intellectuals were on the whole on surer ground on the subject of, the, of, the, of Beatlemania than they were when discussing the Beatles because um, Beatlemania fitted into ready-made models of mass culture and because it accorded with their role as public intellectuals providing judgment and guidance and also because Beatlemaniacs were effectively the um, opposite of intellectuals as intellectuals saw them. So they were creating a portrait of themselves um, in reverse. Their standard reference points when discussing Beatlemania included Matthew Arnold's Culture and Anarchy, um, F.R. Leavis's Fulminations Against Mass Civilization, Freudianism in its loosest sense, so um, an interest in irrational behaviour, especially during childhood and adolescence, that could be attributed to sexual motives. And this reliance on decades-old models was testament to how little understanding of popular culture had developed in Britain um, subsequent to these writers. There wasn't a lot of interest in pop music in the decade before the Beatles among um, serious writers. And what there was was from left-wing critics no less troubled by mass culture than the Leavisites who they critiqued. So the 1950s work by Richard Hoggart and Raymond Williams um, gave more attention to working class culture than had Leavis, but was no less sympathetic, um, or no more sympathetic I should say, to Erzat's Americanized fodder consumed by what Richard Hoggart termed the jukebox boys. Um, the New Left Review was innovative in giving pop music attention, but it was derivative in its condemnatory tone. Um, and so a serious study which accepted the legitimacy of pop music or pop culture as an art form barely existed. And Colin McInnes in 1958 um, stood alone um, and um, trying to um, battle against what he termed the abysmal ignorance of educated persons about the popular music of the millions. Now, Beatlemania brought little modification of these attitudes. The spirit of Matthew Arnold was invoked by Paul Johnson in his attacks on what he termed the Beatle menace. The leader side, Donald Hughes, claimed that everything in the Beatles story illustrates the main thesis we've put forward. That was a full frontal assault against mass-produced pop. Um, psychoanalysis was introduced by, in, into the debate by, Rich, by David Holbrook. Ted Willis was crudely ho ho Hogartian um, in his denunciation of candy floss culture. And these sociological models also involved um, a uh, criticism of the music industry. Commerce was essentially held to blame for the exploitation of vulnerable children and adolescents. So Donald Soper went so far as to prefer the, Sovi the Soviets, with all their faults, as he put it, over Western culture corrupted by Beatlemania. This wasn't the whole story. There were intellectuals who responded sympathetically to the Beatles in the time of Beatlemania, but they did not fundamentally challenge the premise of these critics about either Beatlemania or the music industry. On the contrary, they were at pains to distinguish between Beatles on the one hand and their fans on the other, between Beatles and other pop musicians, and between fans 
and themselves as critics. So um, these, th th these sympathetic commentators, like William Mann, um, distinguished themselves from the fans by beginning, in this case, his article by disclaiming any interest in a fandom which finds expression in handbags, balloons and other articles bearing the likenesses of the loved ones. Moreover, whereas teenagers were interested, he said, in the Beatles' noisy items, he heaped particular praise on their slower numbers. So this boy with its chains of pandiatonic clusters and not a set second time um, for its aeolian cadence. The Beatles were also distinguished from other artists by, um, by man crediting them with injecting a distinctive and exhilarating flavour into a genre of music that was in danger of ceasing to be in music at all. Um, the submediant switches he identified as a trademark of Lennon and McCartney songs do not figure much, he wrote, in other pop repertoires. And by way of contrast, Dave Clark 5 were just pops. You can't talk about their pandiaconic clusters, he wrote. Um, Stuart Hall, um, in his work, The Popular Arts, which he wrote with um, Paddy Wannell, or Wannell, um, similarly contains standard disqualification of pop from being genuine popular art. But it does claim that the Beatles were a distinctive break with earlier patterns, so they're less relentlessly manufactured in their music, their lyrics are less moony, and they are more authentic. There's something of the native quality of life that comes through. Um, these sympathetic writers also contrasted Beatles to their fans. So in contrast to Beatle maniacs, Beatles were for a start male, and as such less alien to the overwhelmingly male and frequently rather chauvinistic ranks of the intelligentsia. They were a shade older, they were more articulate, they were more intelligent. Um, Terry Eagleton in 1964 talked about how they displayed a quality of sceptical self-aware detachment um, which represented Pop's elevation from secondary modern to grammar school. They were also creators rather than consumers. So Mann referred to Lennon and McCartney as being composers and their combo as the Beatle Quartet, as if it was somehow a bit like the Amadeus or the Vey Quartets. And he drew parallels between Beatles compositions of those of Peter Maxwell Davis and Gustav Mahler. The Beatles' creativity received further attention from intellectuals with the release of um, the film A Hard Day's Night, um, which surprised people by its wit, invention and knowingness, and John Lennon's um, publication of In His Own Right. And here, as you correctly identified, this is the um, Foyles Luncheon, um, which was um, held on the 400th anniversary of Shakespeare's um, birth. And, um, uh, caused a bit of a ruckus for having um, John Lennon as its guest of honour. Um, so, did the Beatles, as opposed to Beatle maniacs, win over intellectuals in the early 1960s? Well, on the whole, not. So, these sort of Beatle files were very much in the minority, and they were an embattled one at that. So, every prominent early sympathiser was roasted by fellow intellectuals. Um, William Mann, David Sylvester, who compared the Beatles to Monteverdi, um, Richard Buckle, the ballet critic, um, sarcastically compared the Beatles to Beethoven and spent years <coughs> trying to explain that he didn't mean it. Um, and criticism extended also to publishers and broadcasters who devoted excessive attention to them. So Malcolm Muggeridge, pined for a Rethian BBC, which would have given no broadcasting time to the Beatles' bleat. Um, and the Sunday Times and Observer um, were described by the composer Michael Nyman as quote-unquote intellectual Sunday newspapers <coughs> for running serialisations of Beatles' biographers. Bi bi biographies, rather. The Beatles were altogether too callow to be taken seriously, and while their education was a cut above that expected of pop stars, it was hardly likely to impress intellectuals. 
Eagleton did get the Beatles into grammar school, but he placed them in the B stream. And the literary critic Michael Wood considered that John Lennon's books were a kind of intelligent, informed and infantile humour which belonged um, in grammar school. So it was as if the Beatles had never graduated. Um, there was concern about the Beatles' lack of musical qualifications. The Oxford Don, um, John Sparrow, argued that great thinkers, artists and scientists were generally the fruit of training and of discipline, and the Beatles could claim neither. Critics were critical that they could not read a note of music, their musicianship was thought passable at, de at best, so in the Sunday Times Insight um, uh, article on the Beatles in 1966, Starr was described as one of the most moderate professional drummers in Britain, and the best instrumentalist of the four, um, according to the Sunday Times, George Harrison, was nonetheless only a passable guitarist who might be ranked in the top thousand in the country. Um, McCartney and Lennon are reasonably good amateur composers, it concluded. This led many of them who saw any merit in the Beatles recordings to attribute it to their producer, George Martin, and to the session musicians who played on their recordings. The Beatles were considered even less qualified to branch out into other genres. And so I've got lots of quotations saying how terrible they were as filmmakers and as artists. Um, they were prepared to tolerate the Beatles um, if they did not get above their station. But intellectuals sought to cut them down to size and to put them in their place if they presumed to be artists or intellectuals. So John Lennon's writing was not to be taken seriously. At best, he was just popularising the punning of James Joyce. Um, he lost face at this event, um, the Foyles' luncheon, because he refused to give a speech. Um, Sir Alan Herbert, who was the head of the, Guild of Wri the Writers' Guild, I think, um, at the time, described, described this as a shameful affair. Um, their, although a hard day's night um, was promising, their stock fell with each subsequent film, um, which was fair enough, actually. Um, and so, in all of these ways, um, I think that um, there was a limited um, but rather confined um, embrace of the Beatles by intellectuals in the early 1960s. But now I'm going to go on to the um, later 1960s when there was a more concerted attempt and see whether that was the turning point. So, the emergence of rock music, quote unquote, in the second half of the 1960s changed the terms of the debate and necessitated another look at the Beatles. So I've argued elsewhere that however artificial we may think it is, many mu prominent musicians and writers came to believe in a binary division between rock and pop um, from 1965 onwards. And rock was thought to be a different beast to pr both previous beat music and to contemporary pop. First of all, in its lyrical sophistication. Now, early Beatles lyrics had been somewhat of an embarrassment for their defenders. So, um, John Willett um, distanced himself from the trite sentiments and undeveloped language of the Lennon-McCartney songs in 1964. But by 1966, he was arguing that the language of the new Beatles songs is much superior to the old pop drivel. Um, musically, um, there is a embrace of the Beatles, which um, this is the point at which I start scribbling wildly, so I'm going to have to apologise um, when there are sort of lacunae in the script. That's where I can't find where I'm meant to be. Um, so in terms of music, there was an argument that um, music could no longer be reduced to its mode of production. Um, and that its reception was not to be um, thought of as the primary focus. So the poet, Tom Gunn, argued the new music in England has an artistic as well as a sociological importance. The audience for rock music was thought to be different. It was thought to be 
um, less passive. It was definitely thought to be less female. And um, there was a general attempt to um, follow the path to legitimization that had previously been taken by jazz and folk. So jazz music and folk music had already been partially accepted as a kind of more respectable, more authentic and um, more advanced form of popular music. But um, the claims for rock went further. There were s several aspects to this. First of all, there was an attempt to create a hierarchy and a canon within popular music. So the music critic Derek Jewell um, spoke of the necessity of establishing standards of discrimination in popular music because, as he put it, pop is now as indefinite a label as jazz or classical music. So in order to um, create this <coughs> um, hierarchy within pop, there, was a, there were the first tentative attempts to reject the mass culture model um, of all pop being the creation of an industry which was exploitative and ultimately debasing of art. Um, a, second, um, a, a second aspect of the claims for rock music was to challenge the hierarchy between pop and high culture. So um, there was this claim if I can find the next book I meant to go to, um, that the lyrics are poetic. Um, so Christopher Logue, the poet, celebrated the new poetry, and Tom Gunn, who I just mentioned, spoke ha of how the Beatles had moved beyond the formal and unrealistic lyrics of the 1950s and early 60s, and that there'd been an expansion from Hard Day's Night in 1964 onwards, both in subject matter, so as he put it, any kind of experience, including some that had hitherto not only been unused but taboo, became possible material for lyrics, and also a more sophisticated um, use of form. So he spoke of how Eleanor Rigby was similar um, to W.H. Auden's Miss G, but was in fact superior to it. And a few other songs um, were, as he put it, excellent poems, better in fact than many that get printed in books and magazines. And indeed, Beatles lyrics did start getting printed in books and magazines. Um, so they appear in the Penguin Book of Oral Poetry, in Carl Miller's Writing in England Today, um, in James Kirkup's Anthology of Poetry, Shepherding Winds. Um, as for music, um, the, the, the um, journalist Tony Palmer stated that perhaps the best of pop music has shown for the first time that the rigid authoritarian categorization of music into classical and popular, with the implication that the latter is somehow inferior, is just no longer good enough. Ultimately, he said, there are just three kinds of music, whether it's composed by the Beatles or by Brahms. Good music, bad music, non-music. <laughs> um, you begin to have... Um, serious music critics um, coming on board. So William Mann was already there um, and he, re he remains their champion. But you see people like Wilfred Mellers, who in 1964 um, had, um, had been really quite sniffy about the Beatles, um, moving to a, peer, a, a stage by 1967 where he talked of how Sergeant Pepper had signalled that the vast gap between the serious and the popular arts seems to be closing. Um, you also... Um, OK. Um, and Derek Cook is another important critic in this respect. Um, so, in 1963, um, he talked of how the Beatles <coughs> produced musical vacuity of a cheerful, engaging, unintellectual kind. Um, but by 1968, he was talking about how Lennon and McCartney are genuine creators of a new music. Um, now, these um, proponents of the, of, of the worth of rock music in general, and the Beatles in particular, um, 
were divided over whether um, you needed to introduce um, new criteria in order to be able to measure the worth of rock music and of the Beatles, or whether you could use the same criteria as high culture. So, um, in terms of those who argued for new criteria, people like Christopher Logue um, talked of how academic terminology used by literary critics would look silly applied to Lennon and McCartney. And in terms of music, the rock critic um, and, and journalist more generally, Geoffrey Cannon, um, spoke of how musical musicological techniques were equally inappropriate um, when applied to the Beatles because they are necessarily esoteric and so peripheral as virtually to be disreputable. Now, he, he was arguing it out in this case with Derek Cook, who insisted that a musically literate approach can say something meaningful about pop music, whereas a musically illiterate one cannot. And along those lines, in 1968, he produced a formal musical analysis, musicological analysis of the song Yesterday. As Cook saw it, the only realistic standard is the one that operates on all levels, that of creative genius manifest in ultimate durability. There was also disagreement about whether the Beatles were furthering modernism or counteracting um, modernist arts elitism and obscurantism. So some of the more populist intellectual writers um, celebrated the Beatles as anti-modernists. Um, so the drama critic Harold Hobson, who um, was against the alienation and agitproc techniques used in drama of the period, um, applauded the good sense of ordinary people who, as he put it, preferred, as I myself do, the Beatles to Brecht. In terms of poetry, Christopher Logue um, spoke of how um, this new poetry was full of passion, humour, sexiness, politics, didacticism, gaiety and very loud noise that was absent in the harmless pastoral burblings of canonical verse. Some music critics who were opposed to the avant-garde used Beatles, the Beatles as a stick with which to beat serialists, minimalists and devotees of music concrete. So um, Derek Cook wrote, of, wrote scornfully of how simple, tuneful melody has been abandoned in the classical sphere altogether. All the more reason to be glad then that tunes are still being written, vibrant and vivid ones in the pop field. And he and William Mann and Henry Pleasance, another music critic, all said that they preferred pop to contemporary serious music in 1968-1969. But of course by this point the Beatles were starting to create experimental music influenced by the very composers disliked by people like Cook, by people like, and this is to um, invite the Germans into the into the room, Karl Heinz Stockhausen. Um, and um, have you heard? I haven't heard of this guy, um, Hans Werner Henze. Mm. Okay, uh, I'm glad it's not just me. Um, <laughs> he was a he was another composer who was um, compared to by William Mann to the Beatles and his use of a sort of um, uh, sort of collage of musical techniques. Um, John Cage, of course, was, an, was another influence on, the, on John Lennon in particular um, via Yoko Ono, who was widely despised um, by the more traditionalist of music critics. This all amounted um, to a more comprehensive and sustained case for the Beatles' cultural significance than that advanced in the early 1960s. Um, and I don't think I've missed out anything. Maybe I have. It doesn't matter. Um, uh, and, okay, so... And, 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 and so um, some people um, have seen, in the case of the cultural critic Frederick Jameson, um, the Beatles as being um, representative of high modernism by the late 1960s. Um, others see them as actually pioneering postmodernism um, at this point, and that would make sense if we think of this as being a collapse of 
um, the divisions between high and low culture. Um, but I think it's important <coughs> to recognise um, the degree of um, hostility to the Beatles in the late 1960s. And this wasn't just hostility from the usual suspects, from, um, from you know, traditionalists, um, older intellectuals. So Sgt Pepper received decidedly mixed reviews upon its release, even from the Beatles' natural supporters. Um, Philip Larkin um, criticised Sgt Pepper um, for showing the Beatles floating away on their own cloud. George Melly criticised its woolly, nursery surrealism. Um, if they thought that was bad, then almost everybody hated Magical Mystery Tour, the, um, the, the TV film. And psychedelia was portrayed by most critics in the late 1960s and early 1970s uh, as being at best an embarrassing diversion for the Beatles, and at worst, the beginning of the end. Um, it's also hard to imagine actions more calculated to alienate sober-minded intellectuals as taking up with a giggling Indian guru in 1968 and shacking up, in Lennon's case, with a publicity-seeking Japanese conceptual artist. Um, John Mortimer expressed incredulity about transcendental meditation when appearing in a chat show with Lennon and Harrison. Um, uh, um, Derek Jewell um, awarded John Lennon and Yoko Ono's Two Virgins album the prize for the ugliest sleeve and most boring sound of 1968. And, if, and, and, and accompanying this was a rearguard action um, by um, intellectuals of a more conventional sort um, who opposed rock and all of its works in the late 1960s. Um, there were scathing things said about um, rock lyrics and particularly the Beatles lyrics. So Roy Fuller, this professor of poetry, described them as kitsch. Um, fellow literary critic Julian Becker um, preferred the word inane. Um, Anthony Burgess talked about how even the best songs of the Beatles were only simple little lyrics written by young men of no great education and no great knowledge of our literary past. In terms of its music, um, the Daily Telegraph uh, music critic Colin Mason um, stated that hierarchies exist. Um, this was, um, and, and, and this was um, about trying to resist what um, the writer John Wayne had described as the gigantic scrambling of cultural levels, um, in other words, some, what we might call postmodernism, that was going on in the 1960s, which he associated with John Lennon. Um, they were resisting this, and they were determined um, to, in, to, to assert intellectuals' right to uphold standards and to discriminate between the good and the bad. Um, it was for this reason that Roy Fuller um, uh, chose to um, take on the Beatles' credentials as poets and composers when, in his um, Oxford lectures um, on Matthew Arnold, he was trying to see, as he put it, how his century-old ideas stand up. Um, you also have um, arguments along these lines from people, again, who might have been regarded as, as potentially sympathetic to the Beatles, like Richard Hoggan. Now, this was not just a matter of aesthetics or as a sort of moral duty. It also had economic purpose, because to distinguish between high and low was important um, in a period where the state was subsidising high culture. So Marganita Lasky um, spoke of, in 1965 of the reason why the state has to money, spend money on art and not on the Beatles is that many people want Beatles and only a few want art. So she talked about how 
The Beatles can make people happy or excited or relaxed, but high art, um, which was enjoyed by a minority of people, um, made people consoled, renewed, strengthened, purified, more creative, and even more noble. Um, Arnold Goodman, um, who was chair of the Arts Council at this point, in reference to the Beatles, wrote, sorry, spoke in 1966 of how the pop groups are winning. And we can only win the battle by teaching people uh, what are the worthwhile things in life. He continued, subsidies are now indispensable for the survival of art in this country. Now, this line of argument, um, which separated out high and low culture, um, whatever one might think of it, um, had unfortunate ramifications. First of all, um, the people who were espousing it were condemning themselves to be in a minority culture. So the minority culture talked about by Levis. So the sort of Rethian outreach was effectively being abandoned, if not diluted. <coughs> they were also denigrating not only popular culture, but those who consumed it. So Colin Mason, um, the music critic, spoke of how pop music is mindless, and the playwright Arnold Wesker um, asked, dare we say to all these lovely, arrogant young faces that their music bores us, that the thoughts and emotions evoked by the music are shallow? They're also defining high culture as, wait for it, I can find it. What are they defining high culture as? Um, as um, that was a, that was a hanging thought. Um, they're suggest they're, they're they're suggesting um, what was mine? Oh yeah, sorry, I just had to go up on the page. They're, they're defining high culture as being ipso facto, demanding, difficult, abstruse and out of reach. Okay, so um, the musician and composer Fritz Spiegel charged the Beatles with doing more damage to music than any four other people in history because they offered, as he saw it, instant bliss without effort. Um, their music lacked that reserve which characterises all um, really good music. So there's this idea that classical music is hard, it's difficult. Um, it's, um, as the Times put it, um, it makes exhausting efforts of mind and spirit. Um, another consequence of this argument was that they suggested that intellectuals um, who supported the Beatles were either not intellectuals by definition or they were um, treasonable. Okay, so um, Max Belloff, the historian, claimed that um, the idea that the Beatles are no worse than Beethoven um, was, was part of what he called the challenge of barbarism and represented the treason of the intellectuals that is at the root of every society's decay. So, uh, what this means is that it's often sort of degenerated into name-calling and an attempt to disqualify opponents from um, being accredited as intellectuals. So, the German-Austrian historian George Lichtheim, anybody got an idea where he came from? No, I can't remember where he came from. Anyway, in 1970, he talked about how the pseudo-intellectuals of today cannot tell the difference between Beatles and Beethoven. Um, the final problem with this argument was that it was ultimately declinist and even apocalyptic. So um, Malcolm Muggeridge talks about how he was born into a dying, if not dead, civilization. Um, Roy Fuller describes um, himself as living in a, in a Weimar period. Bernard Levin talks of how our age is not declining because it likes the Beatles, but it likes the Beatles because it is declining. 
So, in conclusion, the sort of 60s I've been trying to um, conjure up is not that um, of any simple cultural revolution, but it is also not that of the sort of um, complacent conservatism that is portrayed as a sort of revisionist view. Instead, it is defensive, it is declinist, it is largely elitist. Um, <coughs> the, as I've mentioned before, there's not, there, there, there aren't demographics here which easily um, a, a, identify people as being on one side or the other of the fence. So you've got um, Hobsbawm and Wesker on the left, and Beloff and Worsthorn on the right. You've got people within the 60s generations, within the generation of the angry young men, the movement poets, mm -hmm. within the, th the, th the, the surviving 30s intellectuals who are both pro and anti-Beatles. You've got poets, you've got rock critics, you've got literary critics, theatre directors, broadcasters, composers, jazz musicians, um, pop artists um, on both sides of this debate. On balance, however, the weight of opinion is aligned against the Beatles. In fact, it's hard to find any unequivocal um, boosters for the Beatles in the 1960s. Even its best-known supporters had their doubts. And they also exposed themselves to ridicule. In some ways, this was a low-quality debate. Um, these people were meant to be intellectuals, but the arguments they used were often themselves emotional, irrational, ill-informed, poorly researched, and illogical. Um, and in that sense, it was unedifying. Um, but in the sense of showing a troubled and changing, but reluctantly changing society, I think it provides a useful portrait of an age. Thank you.